Hello and welcome to the Geek Nighter podcast. I am your host Kevin Yapte, and today I am joined by Micah, who is the founder of Aroyo. Aroyo is the distributed steam processor, pretty modern, written in Rust, and we are going to talk about his experience in building Aroyo, and specifically, we are going to dive deep into the choices they have made while choosing Rust. What was the thought process like, and if there are some suggestions for people out there. who are on the similar boat and trying to choose between rust and some other systems programming language the way i got to know about micah's like aroyo system is that he shared a blog post written on the same topic it's pretty detailed so i will also add that in the description if your viewers are interested please take a look but yeah for now welcome micah i'm really excited to have you here and thanks for joining let's start with a little bit of introduction for our viewers yeah thanks for having me I'm really excited to be here So yeah, I basically have spent most of my career last five or six years leading stream processing teams, real time data processing teams. Most recently at Splunk, and then before that at Lyft, and have spent a lot of time working in the data ecosystem, and especially in the real time data ecosystem, working on tools like Flink and Beam, building infrastructure around them, tooling and supporting. lots of users who are trying to develop against these systems and and that experience of of working for so many years trying to bring real time data to these companies seeing how powerful that can be at lift especially this was like very transformative to the company but also just how challenging it was how many people it took how difficult it was for our end users to build these correct systems on top of these these platforms and So that that drove me to start Arroyo to really try to fix this problem, make something that is actually easy enough for engineers who are product engineers or data engineers who are not experts in this this sort of technology, enabling them to really just pick this up and build these correct, scalable, real time data pipelines. Yeah, pretty interesting. Before we proceed, I want to talk to you about three on demand video courses, and these are top tier when it comes to serverless. These courses are brought to you by theburningmonk dot com. The first one is AppSync Masterclass, where you will learn how to build performant and scalable GraphQL APIs quickly and cheaply. You will build a Twitter clone using AppSync, Lambda, DynamoDB, Vue.js, and Tailwind CSS. The second one, testing serverless architecture. You will gain more confidence in your application without sacrificing a fast feedback loop. And the third one is the Production Ready Serverless course. Here you will learn about the best practices for building production ready serverless application in a hands-on workshop. So if you want to sign up for these courses, check out the link in the description. and you can get a 20% discount using the discount code geek narrator thank you so th- there's definitely a lot of systems there out there they are trying to solve a similar problem and flink one one of them being the most popular one but it's written in java we will dive deep into what what problems did you face while using flink let's say at splunk and we'll talk more about that but i'm also curious about the name uh, aroyo is there a story behind the name if you can share that Yeah, in California where I live, an arroyo is a seasonal dry riverbed. So mm-hmm. it's like in the desert, it's a riverbed that sometimes is dry when there's a big storm, it like flows with water. And the kind of metaphor there is that arroyo, the product aims to be really good at like auto scaling, dealing with like vastly different quantities of data. And so we're following that image. Okay, pretty cool, pretty cool. Nice. So as your blog describes the problem right, I would also like to you follow the similar approach where we talk about the the historical context like what has been the history in terms of systems programming and we all know that C++ has been the go-to language for writing any distributed system infrastructure components and then there was Java which was very popular and then also Go became really popular with systems like Kubernetes and CockroachDB and then the Rust uh, language which is new when it when we talk about the the entire ecosystem and so give us a little bit of historical context when it comes to systems programming and how these ecosystem were, were developed over the time and how did we reach the current state yeah looking at like the history of like big data systems i think i really draw the beginning at kind of google's trio of papers in what is it like 2003 to 2006 or so which was Google file system MapReduce and Bigtable. These were like the three like transformative systems that built all of the modern big data infrastructure we're familiar with today. 
And it really proved something that was, I think, pretty unobvious at the time, which is that we can do big data. We don't need like a, a supercomputer. We don't need like a high performance computing setup. We can use just like a network of like ordinary Linux boxes. And, and back then they were very, very humble machines. I think the original yeah. Google cluster had 200 megahertz CPUs and like one gig of RAM, very limited machines, but they were able to process the entire index, the web at that time, just by building these distributed systems on top of these machines. Yeah. And that pattern was very, very new at that time, but now is how we build all systems, like internet scale companies. Yeah. There was a long trend of just everyone kind of copying Google and the systems that they designed. Yeah, and those early systems were written in C++. But an interesting decision that Google made at that time was that they didn't release any code for any of those systems. Mm. What they did instead was they wrote papers describing how they worked. And that led lots of people to try to re-implement these systems. That's how we ended up with Hadoop and MapReduce and HBase which are just like the kind of open source versions of those three Google yeah. systems. Yeah. And I think it's just an interesting historical point, but like Google wrote those initial systems in C+, but Dave Cutting, who, who created Hadoop, he just liked Java. Mm. I think I've tried to do a fair amount of research on the origin of that decision, but mm. I think it was just Java was pretty hot. And this is like 2004, I want to say. Okay. And he'd been playing with it and he built what became Lucene, <clears throat> which is like the Java search index. And just decided he was going to try to use Java for these re-implementations of these Google systems. Um, and that ended up driving, basically, Java dominated the kind of big data space from there because everyone was using Hadoop and was building on top of Hadoop. The Hadoop file system, for example, had really good Java binding, so it was the obvious technology if you were going to interact with those systems. And that, yeah, that sort of carried us to, I would say, like the, the early 2010s when um, Go was starting to become more popular in general. And then I think that really hit a point where it started becoming a more default choice when Google released Kubernetes and that was written in Go. Mm -hmm. Actually, an interesting historical point is that the original version of Kubernetes was in Java, but at some point the team decided to rewrite it in Go before they yeah. open sourced it. And then from there, a lot of people were very excited about Go. People had been frustrated with Java, had been frustrated with garbage collector, with operations, with the challenges of developing in the Java ecosystem. And Go seemed like a much simpler option in a lot of ways. And so we saw a lot of these newer systems in that era built in Go. And yeah, you mentioned like CockroachDB, the second version of InfluxDB, for example. Yeah, there's like the every new big data system for about five mm. years there was written in Go. And meanwhile, the Java systems still were there. People were still building on top of them. But yeah, I think today, as you mentioned at the start, like we're seeing Rust kind of taking a big part of that kind of mindshare. And also, interestingly enough, C++ has returned as another common target as people are finding kind of the problems with Go and Java in terms yeah. of writing high performance systems. So yeah, that was a bit of an overview. I'm happy to dive into kind of any of those yeah, areas. So that, that, I think that historical context is really important. Like, where are we coming from? And so when this these systems were written, like you mentioned, Google file system, right? And then there was a time when Java was hot and HDFS or Hadoop system was written in Java. So as you mentioned, we don't know the historical reason, like why, what kind of thought process was that? Like why they chose Java? Maybe they knew Java better. Maybe they th thought Java will be improved in future to reach that kind of performance levels. But whatever it was, it, it has worked quite well, right? And of course, in, in terms of how people have adopted uh, these technologies, so it has worked mm -hmm. quite well. But then people who are actually managing these systems had a hard time debugging issues and facing different infra level issues. Go was another language which tried to solve giving certain high level abstractions while keeping the performance uh, quite similar to C and also keeping the learning curve low, right? Go is a very simple language if we talk about C. And then Rust, as you mentioned, is becoming the new kind of standard, uh, let's say at least taking a good share of these systems which are returning. So I would love to talk about more about, as you mentioned, C++ is also co coming back. So what is the reason? Are there some recent improvements that has tackled the problems where people could not write memory safe code, for example, or what has changed? 
Yeah, I think I, I would sorry you people can't write memory safe C++. Definitely the language itself and the tooling around it has come a long ways since like I started my career writing C++ 12 years ago or something. So it's uh, the more modern versions of C++ definitely are substantial improvements. Unfortunately, they like sit aside all of the other versions of C++. So you really have to be careful about exactly which parts of the language you use. And there's also like really good tooling like Ubi and other like memory scanning tools. But yeah, I think the resurgence of C++, I think is partly that like the, the ecosystem has gotten much better, but also before I would say Rust became more mature, it really was the obvious choice for writing is like high performance systems. Yeah. And I think as systems have gotten bigger and the data volumes have gotten bigger and maybe like costs have become more significant for companies, like there's a, an increased focus on like the performance and efficiency of your systems mm -hmm. and paying the overhead for writing Java or Go becomes less acceptable. That, that makes sense. I, I was also thinking like for any kind of ecosystem or language ecosystem to succeed, it also needs a great community and the community must also have the young enthusiastic developers while having like really senior folks who know the ecosystem in and out, like when there are complex issues, they can support the community. And I guess what I feel is over the period of time, since the new developers are more, let's say, trained on Java and Python and some uh, people also start with Go. So I guess the level of experience or expertise required in the older languages like C++ has been degraded or let's say not up to the mark. So do you think is that that is also one of the reasons like people are more focusing on at least in the recent uh, systems that have been written, they mm -hmm. focus more on Java or Go since they have expertise there uh, and not in C++. So that could also be a reason, right? Yeah, it's definitely, it's much easier to get a junior developer productive on a job or a Go project than yeah. on a C++ project. And I think it, it also is generally easier I think, to move fast. Yeah. So, well, a pattern we, we've seen a lot, I think in the recent years is that there's a, a Java system that became very popular in the market, maybe in part because it was able to figure out the right product experience very quickly. But then people got frustrated with how hard it was to run and how expensive it was. And so someone went and rewrote it in C++ and now that, that basically rewrite gets to leverage the learnings about the product experience mm -hmm. and it is able to build like a more efficient version of that. So like we have Scylla DB, which is yeah. a C++ version. Of, uh, Cassandra. Cassandra, thank you. Yeah. And Red Panda, the C++ version of Kafka. And I think that uh, I would actually say SolidDB inspired a lot of this stuff. They have a framework that's built on top of that is a more modern way to build these very like IO bound database -y systems that mm. is extremely efficient and provides like a pretty simple programming pattern for that. It's avoids a lot of the issues around like multi-threading. And that's inspired a lot of people to take another look at C++ as a platform for, for those kinds of systems. Yeah, uh, totally agree. And that makes sense. Let's dive deeper into, so I would definitely love to talk more about your thought process and decision making, how you ended up on Rust. But before that, I want to set up the stage with some of the problems that these old languages or these more mm -hmm. mature languages like C++ and Java, when systems were written, because one of like really most popular and most successful products were written in these languages. What was the problem? What was the core problem? I understand with C++, there has been some runtime issues because it's not mm -hmm. easy to write safe, concurrent code in C++. Uh, in Java, there is this GC and memory overhead. Also for making some native calls, it uses JNI, which can be mm -hmm. a problem. Let's dive deep into these two aspects, starting with C++. Yeah, C++, the challenge is just, you have to really be an expert in C++ to write correct, safe C++ code. Yeah. And Particularly when we're talking about network services, the safe part is pretty critical. Yeah. I think it's always pretty critical, but especially when like untrusted users are, are directly talking to these services. And that's just something that's been proven over and over again, that almost no one is capable of writing safe. So just as I was writing that blog post, you mentioned the whole tech ecosystem was trying to update the WebP library, lib, uh, which had a massive security issue that allowed a remote remote execution. 
these are like our fundamental libraries are constantly having these, these memory unsafety issues. And especially for new developers who are coming in, it's yeah. really challenging to follow all the rules exactly correctly, and make sure that all of your dependencies are following the rules. And then beyond that, even yeah, beyond like the safety issues, just writing correct C++ is really challenging. Dealing with seg faults in production, crashes. I think the productivity side is also a struggle. Mm. That makes sense. And you know, for, for these systems, as you mentioned, if things are all good, it, it's all good. But then there's one day when there are problems and it's hard to debug and it brings down the entire team's productivity down because it's, something is not working. So people yeah. tend to focus on what they know best. And that's when I guess Java and uh, uh, languages like Go really shines because it's easy to understand the Java code. So if you're reviewing, let's say a C++ code and Java code, I would say Java is pretty easier. Like it's pretty verbose and pretty easy to mm -hmm. understand. Um, yeah, and especially in these like large scale distributed systems, yeah, debugging these issues is extremely challenging. Yeah, I've spent weeks in some cases in my yeah. career trying to debug issues. For example, like in Zookeeper, which is, is in C++, I've spent multiple weeks debugging issues there. And it can just uh, really sap your team's productivity when that's what you're doing. It, figure out these like kind of rare cases in these like network systems. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Let's try to focus a little bit on Java here. Mm. So Java is really popular. I, I have been like Java developer forever, like uh, slightly moved uh, from Java to let's say Python, Scala uh, a little bit, but primarily Java has been my language to write any type of code. And I know GC is a problem, not for, let's say, 90% of the cases where systems have enough memory now, GCs are tuned, and even the default settings would just work fine for you. For But for systems as critical as, let's say, databases and distributed stream processors, GC becomes a problem. First of all, like why GC is a problem, a little bit on that. And then GC has also evolved, right? There are new types of garbage collectors which work really well for large allocations as well. So do you think that has minimized or rather reduced this problem of GC for many other systems? And, and then th the third one, what what are the some like examples of GC problems that you have faced in your experience? So if you can share that. Yeah, I think it is worth distinguishing between kind of application level software and infrastructural software. Yeah. I think Java is a really great choice for application software. I've also spent most of my career as a Java developer. And I think modern versions of Java, especially post eight, especially 11 and 14, have added a lot of like nice quality of life features. And it's really a really productive and powerful platform at this point. And when your focus is on individual productivity, like how quickly can we ship these features? I think it makes a lot of sense to to have a language that is oriented around productivity as opposed to really like maximizing performance. But for infrastructural systems where in our case, like it's a small team is going to build this software and then a much, much larger group of people is going to run it. And mm -hmm. if Arroyo is successful, it's going to be run on millions of CPU cores simultaneously. And they're like the, the benefits of being a little bit more efficient are, are much higher. Mm -hmm. So just with that framing, specifically like the, the problems with Java in this particular space, GC is definitely the, the biggest one. And I've spent a lot of my career tuning GC for these big data systems. And it, I think it's worth considering like what the Java GC was like meant for, which is really like a much more application kind of use case, especially on the server GCs like GC1. It's meant for you. you have a request, it comes in, you do some processing, you generate a bunch of, of objects, and then those objects are freed. They mostly stay in the young generation, which is really cheap for the system to create those objects and to free them. Yeah. And then once the request is done, all that context is lost and forget about all that memory. And these data systems often do not look like that in fundamental ways, mm -hmm. in, in ways that are like really challenging for the garbage collectors. In particular, it's hard to predict the lifetime of data. Data can easily stick around for longer than that young generation and can end up in the other generations that are much more expensive yeah. for the garbage collector to handle that require a, like a full GC sweep in, in GC1. Often the scale of memory is much bigger for databases. Often you will have 
hundreds of gigabytes of heap space, which is much harder for the, the GCs to handle. Yeah. And the impact of GC problems also tends to be higher. So specifically in stream processing, it's really important that we're able to bound the amount of time that it takes to process a particular record. If that starts increasing even a little bit, it causes backups that can destroy the throughput of your entire system. And so like the impact of we're going to take a 30 second GC pause can be pretty high and can cause a lot of like system instability. It also, these are often consensus based systems. So we were using Zookeeper or another consensus system to have like leadership elections. And if you do have a long GC pause, you can get, you can lose your leadership lock and that can cause a lot of thrash in the system. There's a lot of focus as an operator in tune your GC so that you minimize these, these disruptions and you're able to on the latency of processing. And it's, t it tends to be very application specific in a very challenging way. So you, ideally you would just, in the ideal world, you just have a automated GC that just self tunes to whatever the application is doing in order to maximize throughput and bound latency. But in practice with Java at, at these scales, like you have to, you end up like really tuning every application. So yeah. in, in the Flink world, like every line that you're running at scale, like you, you end up having to do some custom GC tuning and that really limits the ability of like end users to just build these things on their own without Java experts in the room helping them. And you mentioned new GCs, definitely like that's come a long way. Already G was dramatically better than CMS, the, the yeah. previous server GC mm -hmm. and newer GCs like ZJC solve a lot of those like big heat problems that G, G, G always struggled with. But they still aren't really at that ideal of like self-tuning where the JVM itself is able to adjust those parameters to what the application is doing. And it still requires a lot of that like manual looking at GC logs and figuring out like why, why is this data ending up in old generation? How can we tune those sizes to, yeah. to make sure that like processing is, isn't generating more of this uh, thrash in the GC than we expect. And in terms of you asked for stories, I, there aren't, <laughs> I feel like every GC story is basically the same. It's you have GC pauses, it's taking down your services and you're having like these constant your elections and you look at the GC logs and it's yeah, our young GC phase is like a little bit too small. We need to make this bigger or we need to change this time here. And so that was a lot of like operation that I live for example, is observing GC pauses and taking those kind of actions. The other just cost is that if you don't want to be really rigorous about how you manage your GC collection, your GC configurations, the kind of easy option is to just have way more RAM than you actually need. Yeah. And I think in practice, that's what a lot of people who run these systems do, but RAM is expensive. We're all paying AWS costs here and that that adds up pretty quickly in a way that is very legible to businesses at scale. Yeah, that makes sense. And I've also heard that on your point that people typically try to give more RAM to have a little bit more breathing space when GC is running and it has less burden. And But I've also heard and also experienced in one of the systems where let's say you, you can have up to let's say 32 gigabytes of RAM. And, but you, once you go beyond that, it's really gets really heavy and it has some bottleneck there and it doesn't perform well as you would expect it to. So it also has a limit. That's what I want to emphasize on. Yeah. And this is where the newer GC algorithms do a lot. The one uh, ZGC is able to handle hundred, multiple hundred gigabyte heaps pretty effectively, mm -hmm. but that's something that the older GC struggled with a lot. That makes sense. And there, there were always approaches to tune the GCs to do better with larger heaps or ways to segment the heaps, or in a lot of these systems, you can run multiple processes. So have multiple heaps on the, the same machine. Yeah. Different ways to break up the memory. That makes sense. Cool. So I guess we now understand what has been the problems with C++ and Java ecosystem. And the important point I want to emphasize on is for most of the applications that are not really rigorous in terms of how they want to manage their memory and GC tuning, 
just give more ram and java would just work fine for you if you have expertise in java and if you want quick to quick product development for other use cases I, i'm i'm not sure how to say it in percentage but let's say 1% use case uh, if i just have to emphasize that it's really small use cases that things get critical if there is a ton of gc pause so i get then you have to think about other choices okay. with this let's focus a little bit on go and then we'll talk more about rust and your choice right so what was the problem with go because go has been or has tried to hit this middle spot where it's also simpler to learn it doesn't have this gc problem and it also has Let's say arguable <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, so let's focus on that. What was the problem with systems that are written in Go? Yeah, and I'll, I'll say up front, like I, I spent most of my career, as I mentioned, as a Java developer, started as a C++ developer. So I have a lot of experience with those ecosystems. Um, I'm much less experienced with the Go ecosystem, although yeah. we ran a lot of Go systems at Lyft. And I've also written some Go operator code for Kubernetes. But I've never worked on like a Go base, for example, so... Yeah, speaking a little bit less authoritatively there. I'm also a confirmed Go hater. I have that bias. But yeah, I think Go definitely was a reaction to Java in a lot of ways. So it focused on things like having really fast compilation times, having a, a very simple implementation. So the GC implementation is extremely simple and focused on minimizing latency at the cost of throughput. And these are generally opposed, like throughput and latency, but also it's just simple in a way that maybe didn't maximize either of those in ways that, for example, the Java ecosystem has shown that you can. Like newer Java G GCs or like Azul's that has extremely low pause times while still getting much throughput than the Go GC. Mm -hmm. But there are also some good like design decisions in Go that reduce the pressure on the GC in general. So Go has much better like flow analysis of the data so it can keep more stuff on the stack than java is able to and that makes the problem of writing a good gc much easier it's just less stuff ends up there and i think people got very excited about this i think it was new the java ecosystem had a lot of craft at that point there was a lot of these very enterprisey libraries that people were really frustrated with it's a super yeah. verbose language in some ways less so now. And some people got really excited about Go. It was, felt like a breath of fresh air for these people who spent their careers in Java. Yeah. And I think people maybe got a little bit overexcited about that. People got especially very excited about the concurrency primitives in Go, the channels and like lightweight cons uh, concurrency primitives that does make a lot of these like distributed systems in some ways easier to build. It turns out there's a lot of ways to screw those up and the language doesn't provide a lot of guardrails to mm -hmm. write those things correctly. And that's something I think the industry spent like the next several years discovering. And from Lyft, we had some really heinous Go bugs that were in that category. And then the, the type system is also very limited in ways that lead people to do a lot of kind of dynamic typing stuff. Also has led to some pretty nasty bugs I've seen. So yeah, I think it's like Go is so good at getting you like 90% of the way there really quickly. You can build very impressive systems that look like they work pretty well. But I think people have been discovering, especially in the last three or four years, the limits of that approach that just getting something done really quickly is not always the right answer in these like systems use cases. Again, I think Go is a great application level yeah. programming language where you're trying to solve some business objective really quickly. But for these infrastructural pieces where thousands of people are going to run them and they're going to find every edge case, Go makes it really challenging again to get everything correct in, in those contexts. And, and makes debugging those issues quite challenging, kind of channel-based programming. Yeah. I'm a little curious to know what kind of bugs or what, like if you want to classify, like there are, let's say memory issues or there are concurrency issues and all those kind of problems. So what are these bugs that we are talking about here? What are the most common bugs? Yeah, from the concurrency side, the most common bugs are in the category of if like deadlocks or live locks where like the Go concurrency is not very structured. So it's easy to, to like misuse channels to, to do this correctly, especially with shared memory, like you need texts and language doesn't really help you, help guide you to like where those are necessary. And then it's easy to 
just go wild with channels without really thinking through like exactly the kind of sequence of events that can lead to like a, a deadlock, for example. So yeah, that's like the most common thing I've seen in, in terms of like concurrency. And then in terms of like general Go bugs, I think the tendency to use interface, like empty interfaces for everything to get around limitations in the, the type system, mm -hmm. that's led to a lot of bugs. The, I don't know if I can talk about this, but the worst one I ever saw cost with like $3 million to uh, for getting a, it was like loading a value from a file and the type system basically didn't let the user distinguish between the loading failed and and no value being available for this one particular thing and that caused live not to charge a fee for several months oh that, okay. yeah literally <laughs> led to millions of dollars in lost revenue this so, also looks like an observability problem though but yeah there's a we can argue definitely some observability issues there too but if it's only happening in this case, like some small fraction of the time, yeah. it can be pretty hard to detect that. That's right. That's right. But it can still add up significantly. That makes sense. Cool. So far, we have set up the foundation that, you know, okay, that there has been some historical development and there are systems which are working really great. But there are some painful stories as well that a lot of people can tell you about for systems that are written in C, Java, and Go. Let's talk a little bit about your journey about thinking and how did you come up with this proposal that okay let's try okay. rust did you try something other like else before writing it in rust what was your thought process and a process of benchmarking if you had okay. to or prototyping okay is this really a good decision so let's walk through that process first yes yeah, it definitely wasn't like that rigorous sort of process i knew when i started the company that i wanted to use rust and the the project itself started as like a prototype. Some of these ideas I'd been having for how we can improve stream processing. And those prototypes were in rest before really we start actual company or, yeah. or started work on what is the array system. I personally, my, my journey with rest, I've always been a bit of a language nerd. I got very excited. Haskell in college, probably a lot of people was very into Scala for a while. And then in I would say like 2014, I discovered Rust and it felt like it got so much stuff right and it was very raw at that point. This was like before 1.0, but it really seemed like it was trying to solve this class of problems that no other language really was doing a good job of at that time. And it was bringing a lot of cool stuff from like programming language theory, from like the ML languages, yeah. Scala. And that was pretty exciting to see in a really production quality industrial language. So I've been basically using Rust for a lot of personal projects, for random tools and CLI stuff for a number of years now. Um, but I've never been able to convince a company I've worked for that we should actually do a, a large project in Rust. And starting my own company is the first time no one has been able to tell me no. So we're using Rust. But I think it is also just like the obvious choice at this point. And you're seeing that across the ecosystem. Most of the newer big data systems I'm familiar with that have been started in the last two or three years have been in Rust. Mm. Definitely in the streaming space, it's most of the new systems um, like Materialize and Rising Way are choosing Rust. Some are, are, you don't see a lot of new Java or Go systems mm. in, in this space. And I think that's just everyone has recognized that you have to care about performance at this point, especially post zero interest rates companies care a lot about their cloud costs yeah and if there's a system that is going to cost them half as much to run they're going to choose that system and they don't really care that it was like harder for you to build that makes sense and you mentioned so you tried to convince in previous companies that okay maybe rust is the is a better language to write these kind of systems I'm curious to know what, where the hes hesitation lies. Is it the lack of experience? Is it the lack of maturity in the ecosystem? Where is this lack of confidence coming from? Yeah, I think it, it, it sounds scary to CTO or vice yeah. president engineer um, to adopt a language that most of what they've heard about is that it's really hard. Mm. It's hard to to hire engineers that can do that or to teach engineers to, to do it and sticking with Java or Go is, is definitely much safer Same as a choice. Mm -hmm. But I think also larger companies just tend to not be that ambitious. You know, when you're a small startup, you can 
take these like big risks and, and swing for the fences, but at some level of scale, the leadership wants something that's like more sure, even if it's not the, the best version of that thing, if it has a higher chance of being successful, that that's the bet they want to make. Mm -hmm. But a startup, it's totally the opposite. Like the, by far the most likely thing for a startup is that you're going to fail. You might as well basically take those like low percentage bets that things work out really well. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about some of the features that Rust provides that suits really well for your use case and how has your experience been so far in terms of the speed of development, in terms of also hiring, in terms of running the system in production, right? And also a little bit about the cost of running. So how would rate Rust in these kind of areas and what has been your experience? Yeah, I think the most remarkable thing about using Rust for this is just how fast it is by default. Hmm. So uh, people talk a lot about the speeds of programming languages and sometimes a kind of incoherent way. But I think there is a difference in basically how fast idiomatic versions of things are. Hmm. So in Java, you can absolutely write very fast code, code that is absolutely competitive with Rust or C++. But really fast Java code does not look like Java code. Yeah. If you look at the code that like I used to work in, ad tech doing real-time ad auctions and a lot of our systems were were in java but that code it's extremely weird java it relies mostly on primitives and arrays of primitives you try to reduce the pressure on the gc as much as possible yeah and you issue most of the nice productivity features of java so at that point you're, you're basically writing c in java and like that it's just not what most people think of as as Java. Mm -hmm. and, and Go is similar, like you end up writing very weird Go that leaves out most of the nice features of the language. In some cases, like you have to drop into like assembly intrinsics to get decent performance. But in Rust, really, if you just write like nice idiomatic Rust, it's just going to be really fast just mm -hmm. by default. And there's a big emphasis on this concept of zero cost abstractions where yeah. Rust gives you these really high level looking features like iterators and lambdas and async, but it implements them in a way that they're basically as efficient as a really low level version of that you would with like manual for loops. And sometimes even faster because yeah. the optimizer is able to do more with them. And that, that's so powerful that you can just write good code and it's just pretty fast. And there's so many parts of our system that are like really dumb, just totally unoptimized. You look at the equivalent part of Flink and it's five PhDs have spent time doing a really optimized implementation of that. And we can just do the dumb thing and it's mm. basically as fast as like the thing people have spent so much time optimizing in these Java systems. Mm. So I, I think that's been like the, the most important thing for us is that a small team is able to build something that is like performance competitive with Flink that has had so much time and effort put into it. And then from the, the like productivity standpoint, I think it's actually been surprising given I think a lot of what you hear about Rust productivity, but I would frame it as Rust. It takes a lot longer to get the first version out or at the micro level, it takes a lot longer to get something that compiles, yeah. but the thing you get compiling actually is likely to be correct in a way that is almost shocking when you're first experiencing that. And the, when you actually get something that feels complete, it often is actually complete and correct. Just the number of issues we see in production compared to Java or Go systems I've worked on, it's night and it really like moves, it moves much more of the work like up front as you're developing it and much less of the work like after the fact as you're like debugging issues. Obviously it's not like magic, like you can always write logic bugs and in a complex system, you always will have those issues. Distributed systems are especially complex and we definitely see those issues, but it's just dramatically less than other systems I've worked on. And then, yeah, from, I think as an early stage startup, if we were Google and we were trying to hire 10,000 Rust engineers, that would be really challenging. I don't think there are 10,000 Rust engineers, yeah. um, but as a small startup, I think it's actually helpful yeah. in terms of hiring because people who like Rust are really excited to work on Rust, especially like we're a non-cryptocurrency Rust company, mm. which is somewhat challenging to find as a potential Rust engineer. Yeah, at least at our scale today, that that is much more helpful than it is hurtful to her hiring ability. That makes sense. You talked about, so th those are great points. So you pay some initial premium, but you get you know, long-term benefits when you, once you have a good compiling code, 
that's most probably right at the run time as well and you're not go- not going to face any surprises when it comes to concurrency and memory and all those kind of uh, problems that that does make sense and uh, i want to dive a little bit there and understand what was the the shining feature for you so is it the lack of gc and this uh, the compile time memory management system in in rust or was it still being able to write safe code when we talk about c++ so with this i w- wanted to ask you what was your second choice let's say if rust did not exist what was your second choice was it c++ yeah definitely be c++ okay. i think you just can't be competitive in this space today mm-hmm. if you're writing in java okay and i think that'll be even more true in 2 or 3 years okay yeah if you're starting a new system i think you you basically have to be writing it in a a non-managed language okay interesting yeah so if we have to rank these languages so rust at top at least in your opinion and then c++ and java and go uh, so yeah I, yeah i would put java ahead of go for these cases especially like the there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening in the java world mm. the Yeah, the newer generation of GCs are really powerful and help a lot with these this class of problems. And then also I'm really excited about I think it's called Project Panama. It's a replacement for JN, okay? Mm. That doesn't have the overhead of like today's JN. It allows you to directly interact with C, C memory, which also like fixes a lot of the issues people have. That makes sense. So I think Well, we're going to see oh and there's another project in in the works around uh, structural types that allow you to avoid a lot of the allocations that happen today a lot of the gc impact mm-hmm. so i think go is definitely catching up to or java's catching up to go in a lot of the ways that go has had advantages there and i think we'll see that these guys were definitely proceeding in the future okay that makes sense uh, you also mentioned about the logical bugs that you can still have in mm-hmm. rust because that Rust cannot save you from logical bug because it doesn't know the logic, right? It can uh, save you from these hard to test, hard to debug memory issues and concurrency issues. But mm-hmm. logic tests ideally should also be caught easily when you're writing tests, right? It's not. It can happen in any language. It's really hard to protect that unless you have really good tests, right? Yeah, and I think Rust actually does protect you more than a lot of other languages because mm-hmm. you can really rely on the type system. Yeah. to guide you towards correct code. Mm-hmm. One of the best rust features, I think the thing that should be in every single language is algebraic yep. data types. Mm-hmm. So these are product and sum types and in rust these are called structs and enums. And that is such a powerful way to model your data, especially like having that having enums and match statements over those enums allow you to avoid a, a huge class of bugs around just like handling cases. Yeah. And rust uses this throughout the standard library where it also really helps you write correct code. Mm-hmm. So I, I definitely feel like much more productive from that perspective in in Rust than Java or Go where mm-hmm. you have to be much more careful as your code and the type system doesn't really help you yeah. like drive towards correctness. But you're also right. Like you always need good tests in a system like Arroyo or like another database. A lot of these are like kind of high level tests. Like we have a SQL query and that has a particular output that it should produce put data yeah. and so a lot of our testing is like at that level mm. and that helps find a lot of these kind of like logic bugs and then we also do a lot of randomized testing to try to find crashes and okay. concurrency issues but yeah for any like distributed system you need a really strong testing effort yeah. to be sure that it is actually working yeah that makes sense I have a hypothetical question. So let's say so since we talked about the the GC problems and memory overhead of Java and this is even more stronger when it comes to stateful stream processing, right? Since you're maintaining a lot of state and since you're modifying the state, you're also creating more allocations and all those kind of things. What let's imagine you had to so Arroyo let's imagine it was just a stateless stream processor, mm-hmm. right? So was was GC still a problem or and with this I want to live, dive a little deeper on the stream processing aspect of it right like why mm-hmm. we need so many allocations and why is it a, a good practice in the world of stream processing Yeah maybe it's worth zooming out a little bit and like taking a look at what do these systems actually look like architecturally mm-hmm. I'm guessing most people are familiar uh, with that Arroyo comes from a, a lineage that I think is really comes from flink as the, the kind of original version of this. Yeah. And the basic idea is we have a directed acyclic graph of computation. Kind of thing is like an inverted base mm-hmm. if you're familiar with like how 
database execution works. It's a, a kind of like push model. You have these operators that are doing stateful computations, like you have sources that are like reading from the external world, you have filters, you have joins, group buys, aggregations. Yeah. Each of these operators is performing that computation, maybe storing some state, maybe loading some state and then pushing the results on a queue or on a network socket to the next operator in the path. These are also distributed. Each of these operators is of like multiple parallel subtasks that each get some portion of the data mm -hmm. and there are shuffle or reshard operations mm -hmm. to redistribute the data across those subtasks to, for example, group by. And then when we're talking about SQL, we basically take the SQL query and we plan it and compile it into a graph that looks like yeah. Or you can also, in Flink, for example, write those graphs directly, Java. So that's like the architecture. And then we're planning these graphs across a distributed cluster. So each node in that cluster will run some subset of those operators and some tasks. And in terms of like why, uh, yeah, GC is particularly challenging. At scale, these nodes or these operators are receiving huge volumes of data. Like large versions of these pipelines handle tens of millions of events per second mm -hmm. and many like hundreds of gigabytes per second. So they have to like just at a very basic level read in that data from a socket or from an in-memory queue, yeah. do some operation on it and then write it to their destination. But as you mentioned, like many of these cases, many of these operations are stateful, potentially dealing with like hundreds of bytes or terabytes of state. So think about like, a, a sliding window, for example, you have a one hour sliding window that we're computing over, we need to be able to look up the data for this key, update it in some way, recompute like the next part of the window and then output that. And that pattern of storing and reading data over these very unpredictable timeframes mm -hmm. is really challenging for a GC system. It's like the, the absolute worst case scenario for them. They want like these generational GCs like you have in Java, like really want like one of two access patterns. Like, mm -hmm. Either we produce this data and then we immediately free it and we never look at it again, or we produce this data, we store it and it's stored forever. And the, the more you fall off of those two happy paths, the less effective your, your garbage collector is going to be. And there's a lot of approaches to deal with that, but it's just a fundamentally a hard problem. And so when you're using a language like C++ or Rust, you're able to manage the memory yourself, obviously. And so you're able to structure how you allocate and deallocate memory in a way that makes sense for your application and is able to incorporate application level semantics into that. And that ends up being really important for these uh, things to, to be performant and also be able to like work with like smaller. Memory. That makes sense. And yeah, that, that's a good insight. Why stream processing needs so much state and how much it can be depending on your scale and then GC can be tuned. It needs expertise, but again, there's a hard limit, right? Like you can't tune everything. That makes sense. And with this, I want to focus a little bit on, so nothing comes for free, right? There would be some challenges even with using Rust. So what about, what were the challenges that you would like to highlight to folks who are after listening to this podcast, they are, they're going to jump on the Rust ship. What were the challenges and how do you see in future these challenges will be fixed? Yeah. So the, the meme about Rust is that it's really hard to learn mm -hmm. and it it's true. I think it's a little bit overblown, but it definitely will take engineers a, a longer time to pick up than Go or, yeah. or Java. Mm -hmm. I think like my co-founder, he hadn't worked with Rust before working on Arroyo. And it definitely took him a few months to feel like he was really productive mm -hmm. and was able to contribute at like the level that he expected to be able to contribute. And so that like ramp up time is very real. I think also I was definitely more on the Rust expert side. So I'm able to teach and help with problems. I think if you don't have that, it's going to be a lot harder if everyone's just trying to figure it out. And then there are aspects of the language that are, are quite challenging and you have to really think in a Rust way in order to model your problem successfully and not spend your time just banging against the compiler. The kind of lifetime system is the first one people usually hit if you're trying to store references to data or share references to data. You get to think very carefully about those access patterns and how that data flows through your system. That's it. I think in C++, you also have to think really carefully about that, but the compiler won't tell yeah. you if you're doing it wrong. So in many ways, like Rust 
the, the compiler guides you towards like good patterns, but it does take a while to like really get into that mindset. And then the second thing that's really hard is async. The, the whole Rust ecosystem is really moved to async, especially in the network programming space. And so you, it's pretty hard to opt out of it at this point if you're doing anything that's system programming. But it introduces a lot of challenges. In particular, this gets a little bit esoteric, but the main async runtimes, Tokyo, are multi-threaded. They rely on work stealing. Things can get scheduled on different threads, and then if one thread gets busy, another thread can take its work. What that means is that all of the objects in in context at that point mm -hmm. have to be able to move from one thread to another, which is this Rust trait called send. And so the, the Rust compiler enforces that restriction, which can cause a lot of challenges to make sure that everything that is that is visible at that point is send. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds small, but we have spent a lot of time trying to deal with the, that class of issues. The other side is that the, the benefit side of that is that Tokyo is just incredibly fast. And it's remarkable how it is at scheduling these kind of like bursty workloads that you can see in a system like, like Arroyo. But it definitely takes a lot of effort to like get it happy with those patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that does make sense. And again, you mentioned your co-founder became productive with Rust in, in a few months. And that's remarkable, right? Because even uh, like writing systems code, even with Java, it might take someone a few months at least to be re really productive. I'm assuming he must have his experience over the years, uh, at least those programming languages that could have helped. But for someone who is still, let's say, experienced, let's say 10 years of experience, but not mm -hmm. writing systems code, mo mostly on the application level using Go or Java. This is a question like for any developer who wants to learn Rust, like wh what is a good way to learn Rust? And how much time do you think one would require to be really productive, given he has no systems programming background? Yeah, I think there are like different versions of Rust. So there's the version of Rust where you're trying to be really efficient. And that is definitely the harder version of Rust to write. This is where you're being like very careful about how you allocate memory and when you do things like copy data. And that's important for an infrastructural context, but not even actually not even all of it. Like we have our data plane, like the, the actual execution. And in those areas, we have to be really careful about performance mm -hmm. and spend a lot of time writing that performance sensitive Rust. But like our control plane, for example, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be that efficient or our API doesn't have to be that efficient. For example, we have another engineer who uh, also had no Rust experience before this project. And he's been mostly working on the, the API side. And he's he was able to be productive pretty quickly okay. because you can often take these kind of like shortcuts to get around the harder parts of the language. But yeah, I think it, it is going to take some time for people who haven't worked with C++ especially to wrap their head around yeah. the weird things of Rust. And I think that's something like you have to consider. There's like resource to learn it. I think the official Rust book is really good. It's available for free online. Yeah, print copy of it. That's how I originally learned the language. Back. And then tons of great online resources. And then also call out the official Rust Discord is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing anything with async, the Tokyo Discord was really helpful for me when I was first getting spun up with async Rust okay. and trying to figure out how to make my references send people there are very helpful and patient. I think definitely having a mentor, someone in your company really knows Rust will make this all much easier. Mm -hmm. Perfect. What's in the future? Rust is definitely evolving in terms of the language feature and also ecosystem because more and more developers are adopting Rust. They are interested in Rust because it's, it's one way to get into systems programming without learning C++. And it's a good win even for companies who want to write systems, right? So what's in the future? Like, where do you see Rust communities going? Because what I see is at least the newer system, uh, Rust is on top of their choice when they want to, when they are at a stage when they want to choose between one of the ecosystems. And is, are we going to see all the old systems being written into Rust someday? Like it happened with Java, like new systems were written in Go. But uh, as we also seen Cassandra being written in C CLRD, CLRDB and right. So what is the future when it comes to Rust and its ecosystem? 
Yeah, I think it, it, it'll continue to grow in this particular space mm -hmm. in databases, data systems, these large scale infrastructural pieces. I, I don't really see it taking over application software. I think yeah. Java and, and probably Go will continue to be the most dominant choices there. But anything where like performance is important, I think Rust will continue to grow in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And also in other places, we're seeing it in Linux kernel now. It's becoming, I think, a good choice for writing image formats, drivers, stuff like that. And also embedded, seeing a lot of adoption. Mm -hmm. And then another pattern we're seeing a lot is the, using Rust as a kernel that is then wrapped in other languages. In the Python ecosystem, a lot of core libraries are being written in Rust and Python bindings are written to that. So you're able to do parts that need performance in Rust, but still able to give like a Python interface to that. Mm -hmm. Or in the Java ecosystem, we're seeing all, or JavaScript ecosystem, we're seeing a lot of the core tooling being rewritten in Rust. So I think that's the pattern we'll see going forward is like these kind of like performance sensitive pieces would be written in Rust by like small Rust expert teams. But most developers don't become Rust developers in the next five to 10 years. In terms of the language itself, I think we'll continue to see a lot of the rough edges sanded. There's a lot of like restrictions in the language that aren't really necessary for safety, but were the easier way to implement these features. And we're seeing a lot of work on reducing those like unnecessary restrictions. So the work on the borrow checker is a next generation borrow checker that's like much smarter mm -hmm. about what exactly is safe. There's some annoying restrictions around async today that are being worked on. So I think we'll see all those things become more user friendly. And I, I think that's like the main driver at this point. Okay, perfect. This has been a really insightful conversation. I have better clarity now when it comes to choosing a good systems programming language. I would love to summarize this, the discussion so that it, there's a takeaway from this discussion to people who want to, who are in the same boat, right? So uh, let me summarize and then you can correct me. So what we have discussed so far is C++ has been the go-to language for, for systems programming when there has been some problems like it's really hard to write good, correct C++ unless you are really experienced. So if you are really experienced with C++, you can still opt to go for C++. But it, it since it's easier to transition from C++ to Rust, I think it, it might make sense for you to at least see what Rust has for you, right? If you are not a systems programmer, if you are f f going to focus mainly on application development, then you don't have to leave the Java world or Go world for that. That, that should work perfectly fine for you. And for all the developers who uh, want to move to systems programming like fresh in 2023, probably Rust is the better choice for them to learn. Is this a good kind of a, like a thumb rule for people to at least start? Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Okay, cool. Yeah, as I said, it was really insightful. Thanks a lot for joining me today. And I'm going to add the link to the blog, which is again, very detailed and people should read it if they have the, if they have to make such choices and I'll add it in the description so people can look at it. I've also done some other podcasts on stream processing. Today we didn't go deeper into stream processing, but maybe later sometime in future where we can also talk a lot about Arroyo. Yeah. Thanks a lot again and looking forward for more collaboration in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was a great conversation. Cool.